Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen-Halberstam. I'm the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're so pleased to be able to present films like this one as part of our 360 film program. And as part of that program, next week, we're going to be starting our third annual Boston Israeli Film Festival. So I hope many of you will be able to join us for that. Um, I wanna thank our partner, Coolidge Corners After Midnight series. Um, it's a wonderful series of horror films um, and all of the Coolidge programming is worth checking out at coolidge.org. And also thank you to IFC Films and Tamara Simon from Mean Streets Entertainment, in Mean Streets Management, excuse me, uh, for making tonight possible. And we are so lucky to have with us some really talented actors and director and producer to talk about The Vigil. So please welcome Keith Thomas, The Vigil's writer and uh, screenwriter and director, Rafi Margulies, The Vigil's producer, Dave Davis, The Vigil's lead actor, uh, who you recognize from the film, and Malky Goldman, who you also recognize from the film, who's also an actor in the film. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having so, me. There's a lot to talk about here, and I know that the audience will have a lot of questions to ask um, through the chat function as well. Um, but I wanna start with a question to you, Keith, because um, I'm curious where this idea for the film came from, and particularly the idea of the Mazik, which is not a familiar figure to, in, you know, I don't think, we've all encountered a Dybbuk, we've all encountered a Golem. I don't think many of us have heard of the Mazik before. Yeah, so, I would say it kind of came from a combining of two separate sort of threads. One was me trying to think of if I'm going to make my first horror film, how do I make it something that feels different and new and unique and um, original in whatever way I could? Like, what do I know that I could turn into a horror film? And that ended up being kind of my Jewish studies um, and kind of background. Um, and the second thing was, you know, this idea of a horror film needs to have this sort of central entity or central threat. And if you, yeah, if you look into Jewish horror, it, it appears that there's not that much, right? There's Dybbuk's and we've all seen a couple of Dybbuk box movies and there's Gala movies from like a hundred years ago. Um, so when it came time to kind of dig into that, I it was aware of Shadim, demons, plural, and uh, kind of exploring it, that's how I found the Mazik is one of these Shadims from old rabbinical text. Uh, you know, we're talking like 2000 years ago. Um, it was the Mazik in Hebrew means destroyer. And it was something that was said to inhabit abandoned houses. Um, mm. And that was very intriguing though there was no description of it at all in any of the texts. It's just like, this is a Mazik, don't go in there. There's a Mazik and that was it. So it kind of, I had to kind of come up with, okay, what does this thing look like and how is it going to act? But, uh, you know, once I dug into that, there it turns out there are a bunch, there's a bunch of kind of Jewish monsters or lore that I think people just aren't that familiar with. I uh, certainly in the Ashkenazic world, in the Sephardic world, there's even more, so. And you created this, I mean, the, the look of the Mazik is so vivid in the film. Um, were you basing that off of any research or did that, did you guys collaboratively work on that? Where did that, um, the visualization of the Mazik come from? Yeah, you know, so it, it's always tough creating a boogeyman because there's just so many different, you know, variations of this sort of idea. I think the central concept of something or somebody standing in a corner in the room that you're not noticing is freaky. And I, I liked that idea of it's kind of a shadowy figure. The less you see, it's almost always better because the mind conjures up much worse things than any special effects person can actually create. So it was like playing with that. And then I knew we we're gonna obviously show the beast. So what does it look like? And for me, it's very important that the design of the Mazik be reflective of the character arc for Yaakov. Uh, the Mazik, the demon in the film is feeding on pain and it is purposely attempting to conjure up this pain in people and in their own histories and in whatever histories it is fed on in the past. So the idea with Yaakov is here's a guy who's in crisis who left his community and has to go back. He is turned away from the past. He is, he is trying to move forward. The Mazik becomes the embodiment of 
that. It is always in looking at the past. It is constantly dragging you backward. It is immersing you in the things you most want to leave. So, you know, the idea kind of came up and I thought, hey, this is really cool. Like the idea of somebody with their head turned around backwards. Um, and it was, it was, once I had the idea, it was very interesting. You know, I was like, this is great. This could be cool you know, actually putting it into practice and making it a real thing was much more challenging. Um, but, uh, you know, it felt like it was both hitting the themes of the film, but also doing something that I hadn't seen before. I love the way you sort of wove that theme of turning back from the very beginning of the film when they're at the footsteps meeting, um, when um, there's this argument about is, is the way you sort of heal by dealing with the past or by looking forward. And I'm, I'm not sure we totally have an answer at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear sort of what you were, anyone, any one of you, um, wh how you were exploring that and, and what you were hoping to convey in terms of um, whether it's helpful to look back, whether we, we one needs to deal with their past because um, these demons obviously do haunt you if you, if you don't. Yeah, I saw uh, that as, you know, this, this was like a dark night of the soul, right? It was like an exploration of this one guy's issues and, and his, you know, this is like an inflection point and the house was a crucible. And once he got in it, he was either going to succeed or fail. This was like, he'd been putting it off for long enough and now it was going to happen. And this demon was going to force him to. Um, at the same time, I didn't, it's tricky because I didn't want to somehow suggest that someone who has PTSD or is suffering, um, from the effects of trauma that the answer was, oh, you just burn a demon's face and you're cool and it's yeah. all over. Like, I didn't want to suggest that it, clearly there isn't a easy solution. And it was more about, it was more about challenging the character to find something within themselves to continue to move forward, even though they know that if they turn around, that thing is still there. And it was yeah. kind of like, how do you, how do you show that? Dave, you did such an incredible job embodying Yaakov. Um, I'd Thank love you. to hear a little bit about your process preparing for the character. Obviously, you take on a Yiddish accent in the film, which um, you haven't spoken much yet on this panel, but people will soon hear you don't have. Could you talk a little bit about getting into the character of Yako and, and preparing for the role? Yeah, it was, um, that was a real pleasure. You know, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful thing to be able to learn about a new community. And this is a community that I, especially through the filming process, discovered um, is, is even more of my community than, than I realized as an American Jew, but um, that, you know, my family coming from New York and coming through Ellis Island, it very easily could have been us. And the more Yiddish I learned, the more I realized, well, I already kind of know some of this and my family uses Yiddish. And, and actually I watched the film last night with uh, my brother and uh, my cousin and um, I hadn't seen it in, I think about a year. And it, it all came flooding back to me. And just the lines that, you know, Malki was my, my dialect coach while we were working and my translator and certain things that I would repeat over and over again and certain th that were a little more difficult and certain things that I'd hear and go, I already know that. I, I grew up hearing this a hundred times. And, and there were all sorts of amazing little moments where the more I got into the character of Yaakov, the more I realized that we really were sort of like distant cousins in this way where that easily could have been my life and my family tradition had um, you know my great grandparents had a little bit of a different view towards Americanization and, and religion um, and it's really important to to me and the building the character and and to all of us in the creation of the film in in bringing authenticity to it because this is a story that you know Keith Keith brought so many different elements to it. And in watching it, it's like, I keep getting, every time I see it, I get hit with new layers of metaphor, new layers of character that are, that are in just little pieces of dialogue. And I mean, it's really a beautiful composition. Um, and uh, I forget where I was going with that, but it's, the building of the character was a, an incredible journey. I, you know, we, we cared, what I was saying was we cared about having the authenticity there and that's there in the set design. It's there in Malki introducing me to her friends and trying to figure out really who Yaakov is, not as just 
a horror figure, but as a person who exists in the real world and the film really addresses a lot of, it hits so many subjects from, you know, pogroms to modern day hate crimes. And it, it, it really, it covers a lot of ground. And, and it was important to all of us to know that that was being done in a respectful way and in a way that really brings care to the community and to the people that this film represents. Yeah. Maki, what was it like for you to be both acting and working as, as a dialect coach? Um, I don't know if that was an official role or if you'd sort of taken that on. Um, I just wanted to come... say that Maki is also an associate producer on the film for, oh, okay. for being a dialect coach among, among many other uh, really other helpful things that we couldn't have done the movie without. Oh, thank you. So I'd love to hear about, about your role in that respect uh. then too. It was it was really amazing. It was so um, nice to just really feel you know kind of build the relationship and the the realness of the moment that is actually happening. Because I started with helping out Dave, and then I continued to help him out as an actor. Um, some of the best moments is actually doing Yiddish lines with Dave and him, just getting it so like really getting it. And, and then he would be like, but Maki, if I want to improvise, even just in my thoughts in Yiddish, how would I say, how would I curse? And then I had, I, had, I was so tired. Right. Hmm, how do you curse? And I'm like, you don't, you just stop. <laughs> Little things like that. Um, and then on set, you know, when, when I'm an actor, I have a huge ego and then it's very easy for me to just feel small, but because I, felt so much part of the project and I was listened to and you know I could say what I think I just felt so important and I thought everything was going so great and what I really loved about this project is everyone was there wanting to be there and everyone that was there was part of making it better and more real and authentic and it was well, I can't say which part was more fun I just loved them all this whole experience as a whole was incredible. I thought something really interesting in thinking about sort of your your character Yaakov and Malki also um, your character in in being new to technology to the cell phone and and the way the Mazak had mastered the phone and was able to use it to haunt uh, Yaakov was was really brilliant um, and you know, I, I obviously could not have happened if he was if he he was somebody who had grown up in the secular world. Yeah, and that really goes back to the question that you had asked previously of the building of the character. You know, that's such an important part of, uh, or maybe not important, but it's a major part of how people enter the secular world. You know, what is their interaction with pop culture? What was their first experience with music? Which you know, for Keith was a huge part of. Um, the way that the script was written and the way that the film turned out was the music that, and you know, part of it is Yaakov actually choosing music on his iPod. So what is he listening to? And we talked a lot about it. At one point, I remember um, telling Keith, you know, I think uh, I sent him a YouTube video about primitive technology. And I was like, I think Yaakov went down a rabbit hole of watching these videos. And Keith's like, uh, okay. <laughs> but for me in that moment, I was like really trying to understand how how Yaakov was being introduced to this world that previously he's been completely underexposed to. Yeah, I think the music choices were, I was surprised by the music uh, Yaakov was listening to when he first puts in his headphone and then also the choice to, to end the film with, um, with Jewish music. Can you talk a little bit about the choices that you made in music and also in the sound effects, which were extremely creepy? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, so in terms of like song choices, um, the initial song that that uh, Yaakov listens to at the table when he's sitting down there was something that I came up right when the very first draft of the script. Of course, it was something that I was listening to, um, but it just felt right to me in that it was like this guy has left the community. He's off the derech. He's attempting to be modern and be a part of this world. And, uh, you know, Dave and I talked about ideas about how he would discover this music, like how I could see him trying to be cool, right, and trying to fit in. And like, it's not so much that he'd be like, you know, playing a Backstreet Boys song, and he's like, totally out of date. It's, it's more that he's like, okay, well, somebody somewhere, maybe at a footsteps meeting told him, 
he said, well, what do you listen to? And this person said, yeah, yeah, I like to hear this kind of music. And so he's downloaded this stuff onto this phone and, and he's kind of listening through it. Um, so that was that song. And then the, 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 the song at the end actually uh, was a suggestion that came from Rafi, producer, who's on screen there. Um, and that was actually really fascinating. I, at first, I think, I mean, it's a very Jewish song. Um, at first I was like, ah, I don't know. You know, we've got Yaakov leaving, but at the same time, it really fit thematically and just the sound design. It was actually funny when we plugged it into the edit, uh, it immediately fit. It was crazy how it fit exactly. Like you didn't, usually you, if you plug a song in, you have to change part of the edit. You have to move the, you know, in terms of the end, when the credits roll and everything, but that song fit identically. Um, that band, they're kind of like a hipster chassids. Um, and in term, in order to kind of get approval to use that song, um, I showed them the vigil. I was in Crown Heights and showed them the vigil and, it, you know, they had never seen a horror film before. Um, so <laughs> it worked on two levels. They were scared, which was great. Um, <laughs> but then they actually thought that it was, that it, that it was something that spoke to their beliefs in terms of kind of the overall message of the film. And so they approved it and, that was that was neat, and then you know once we had that, it really kind of fit. Rafi, do you want to add anything about uh, why you chose that song for the end? Yeah, well, I, the, the name of the band is um, is Zusha, uh, and I, I'm a big fan of of their music, particularly that album. Uh, I felt that I felt you know it was, it was obviously a real discussion with with all of us, but I felt the movie needed to, to end on a Jewish note and really just kind of lean into what the movie has been and just go full full emotion the way Spielberg or Shyamalan do. Um, and, 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 and then like Keith said, it was like, once we had the discussion, it's like, okay, let's see what it just sounds like with this song. And it was really was crazy. They dropped it in and then like the, when we wanted the music to start and the music dropped exactly when we cut to black and the, and the credits started coming up. And, and uh, I think it's been, the, the, the feedback has been, has been great on, on, on that song. And I'm so happy that they would let us, they let us use the music and approved it because we intended to make a movie that just kind of looked at the Jewish community and this and Yaakov's specific journey just objectively and with empathy uh, and not portray the Jewish people or specifically the Hasidic community as, you know, demonizing or, or victimizing, which is really just how you see them represented most often in, in, in pop culture. So it was kind of nice to see that we had, we had fulfilled what we set out to do with, with making this movie from that perspective when they, when they let us use the, the songs. Yeah, and there's, I mean, I think it works really interestingly because there are these, whether or not it's a film about belief or faith or practice, I think there's this ele these elements that run through and, you know, whether it's um, Yaakov picking up Jehilim uh, Psalms to read at the first moment he gets scared, even though he stepped away from that community, or saying he's not going to go to morning prayers, but then walking away with this music in the background works to me really resonated in terms of his inner conflict. Um, I thought that looked, worked really beautifully there. Yeah, because he, no matter how you look at the movie, like he has to go back and use these things from his faith and his religion in order to defeat, uh, in order to defeat the mob, like whether, right. whether unconsciously or explicitly. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that's exactly the point we tried to, you know, you take what you, you take your heritage and you kind of make it your own. Yeah. Uh, we're getting some questions in from the audience. Ira Skolnick asks, well, first says this one of, this may be one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Uh, yeah. so is, <laughs> and so is The Exorcist, but I think I know why. There are many similarities. The Shomer is standing outside of the house and looking up at the steps before he goes in. The Shomer watching over the body and saying prayers next to the body. The unknown noise is going on upstairs, the head turning all the way around. Were you influenced by The Exorcist? Um, <laughs> And then he said, and if you, if you say no, not really, could it be that you actually wore it without realizing it? But if you can talk maybe a little bit about um, your other horror uh, influences in making this. Keith, have you seen The Exorcist? What, <laughs> what, what's The Exorcist? Is that a, <laughs> what's, that, what's that about? Is that an exercise video, The Exorcist? Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, Jane Fonda. <laughs> yeah, it's, or let's, yeah, right, it's the aerobics <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, which is very scary. Actually, uh, no, yes. Uh, very much a huge fan of The Exorcist, very influential in this. And that shot of, of Reb Shulam at the bottom of the stairs looking up at the house as they're about to go is very much, you know, I didn't, 
initially plan it to be like uh, very similar to that scene but once i saw it i knew i was like okay yeah that's very much like the exorcist poster <laughs> that's very much this the scene so yeah the exorcist was a huge influence i've always loved the exorcist um you know both in terms in, in two i i see the parallels with the exorcist in terms of a religious horror film um but what i also love most actually about the exorcist is the first half of it is incredibly grounded uh, because they're trying to explore why she is possessed. And is, is this a medical condition? Is this really what we think it is? And goes through all those things and it just really grounds the film, makes it feel very authentic, which is something that I really tried to do with this. Um, and at the same time, it's scary. It has lots of, you know, it, kind of those classic tropes. There's cool little jump scares, uh, you know, the Captain Howdy one in particular. Anyway, um, so The Exorcist is a huge influence. There's another film uh, that I really love that's, I guess, somewhat obscure these days, which is called Jacob's Ladder, uh, which is a horror film from the 90s um, that deals with demons and angels and a kind of limbo in a very, very grounded, down-to-earth New York City way. Um, so, you know, I think those are two, those two were, you know, very much there. They weren't so much things that I was studying them and thinking, how do I recreate that? It was just more, you know, kind of had leaked into my brain over so many years that when it came time for me to construct uh, an idea of what this looked like and felt like in the atmosphere, those were what I pulled from. There's another question here from Anna Fetter. Um, I'm curious about the reception of the film. For someone who grew up in this world, it all rang true. Uh, but I am wondering at how it reads for folks who don't know anything about Hasidic life and footsteps. Um, and, you know, for people who don't know what to fill in is and, and you see him put them on at the end of the film, how, how did you decide what needs to be explained and, and what you can just leave in without explanation? Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about it and we'll let, uh, let others as well. But in terms of like what to leave, for example, none of the Hebrew is translated in the film. The Yiddish is all translated, but not the Hebrew. And again, that came from wanting this to appeal kind of in a universal sense in that, you know, just to step back to the exorcist, I don't know Latin. I've never understood any Latin prayers, but I loved the film and I understood what the, the priests were doing in the exorcism, even though I was not familiar with the ritual. It just made sense. That girl's got a problem. They're trying to solve it. It's the same thing here. Um, Yaakov is facing a demon. We've seen the demon. We've seen what's happened. And him putting on to fill in, him saying the prayers, these are spiritual things. They involve certain spiritual armors, rituals. And I, I just felt like people are going to understand that. And, and if you're uh, cramming the screen with a bunch of subtitles, to, they're not going to be paying attention to the actual just motions of what's going on. It's just hearing the Hebrew. If you happen to understand the prayers and know what these prayers, obviously the Shema, uh, most Jews will know. Um, then it takes on another resonance. But I think, you know, so far the reaction in this, this, this film is opened all over the world. So far the reaction has been very positive. I think, you know, in a lot of places where people are unfamiliar with Judaism and certainly the rituals and stuff, they've, they've gotten the point of the film and they've, they've understood the kind of universal themes of guilt, survivor's guilt, PTSD, trauma, and how these things affect people. We, we always, just to add on that briefly, yeah. we, we, something that Keith and I had always talked about since the beginning is just the idea of let's take the audience and just drop them into this world. We're not going to explain anything. We're just going to put them in it and then let them go through this journey with Yaakov. Um, and we were always under the impression that if we did it authentically, like if, the, I, I always like to say that if the Orthodox or the From community sees this movie, that they're going to by every second of it. They're gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's what would happen in this situation. That's what, what, the, what the prayer would be. That's the Yiddish dialect that the rabbi in the wall makes sense, but that's the rabbi in the wall. And we always understood that if we, or thought at least, that if we treated it authentically, that people would be okay going on that journey with all these things that are not being explained. Um, and that, that, that hypothesis does seem to have, been, to have been correct. And it's been cool to see not only the, the Jewish community responding, uh, emotionally to the film, but the, but the world at large. Yeah, I also yeah, you know I I just saw this movie for the first time in a while last night, and we spend so much time talking about the Jewish influence of the yeah. film, and now that I've started to see the film through the eyes of my friends and my family who are um, 
seen it for the first time, I'm remembering how much of it is really a story about mental health as well. You know, there's really a lot of things going on here. And um, I think that's very interesting as well. Also, I think it's always a success if you see a film or you present a piece of art and people go home and Google it and they want to find out more. That's half of the success. You know, we want to engage the people and want them to want to know more. Yeah, also, and there are so many. Sorry, go ahead. No, and there's also this kind of trust when you see uh, um, a specific, an ultra-Orthodox setting that you trust that this is a ritual and you don't feel like you have to understand. You just say, okay, this is what they do to help themselves, I think, I don't know. Yeah, and as an Orthodox person, there's nothing more frustrating when you see something in, in pop culture that just rings false. You're just like, they couldn't have done a little bit of research, exactly. a little? Uh, so thankfully, and also to answer the original question, we've had no, I don't think, I mean, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anybody from as a, just an audience or a, or a critic or anything has been confused by anything in the movie. Nobody's been like, I don't get that. Right. I don't think we've heard that one. Yeah, no, everyone seems to get it. The tying of the tefillin. I, I don't want to put this in the air or anything too much, but <laughs> twice in an hour, I had different people unrelated refer to that as Jewish Rambo. And I thought that was kind of interesting and worth sharing. <laughs> That's how they should teach kids to do it for their environment. So it might get more people interested in it. You're like, I uh, definitely want to tie to film. Yeah. I have some right here. So I just, and I will just continue because Anna Fetter, who asked that question, also added a comment that she loved the film and comes from a genre world and you managed a very weighty resonance film. She was nervous about how it was going to end. Would he return? And thought that you struck the perfect balance. So um, there's a question here about um, Lynn Cohen, who plays uh, Mrs. Litbach, um, who unfortunately passed away, I think, a, a year ago this month, um, and has been in, in many, many films that have screened at the Boston Jewish Film Festival over the years. Um, she's incredible in it. Um, I'd love to hear more about her character. There's, I wondered when you when um, Yako first shows up and she says he has to leave if she could see that he's somebody who has a pain to him, um, and she sort of acts as as his character's guide um, through everything happening. Can you talk a little bit about developing that character and casting Lynn Cohen? Yeah, you know, when the when it was clear that we have the situation where there's a guy sitting with a body, and the guy who's sitting with the body is coming from a place where he's struggling. And kind of in this crisis mode and we know how the night's going to unfold with this guy uh i wanted to add somebody else to the see it couldn't be just the guy on the body and the demon but having somebody else there to bounce ideas off of and talk to and i really like the idea that that person was also a totally unreliable uh, obviously for different reasons for reasons of dementia um and i loved the idea that you could be freaking out and need comfort and want to talk to somebody and they're just reinforcing the fact that yeah there's something actually really wrong here and you're like wait is this lady crazy or is she is this real um and lynn you know lynn really embraced it she just kind of totally i mean first of all she's an incredible you know professional she had such a body of work when she stepped stepped into that house that she's just a real a real powerhouse and, you know tiny little lady you know compared to dave there's so many there's a couple of great shots in the film where you can see kind of the height difference going on, but she just stood her own. <laughs> and she really, you know, for Lynn, it was a very kind of personal role. Um, the accent she's using is her grandmother's accent, uh, her immigrant grandmother, I believe Ukrainian, I'm not 100% on that. Um, but but she was very much, and throughout the, 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 the development of shoot, she was very, interested in exploring that. Um, she had lost family in, the, in pogroms before the Holocaust. Um, and so that touched a nerve as well. Um, and I think she, she also embraced the idea that she's a creepy old lady. I mean, there's a certain point, you know, when you first see her in the film, right? She's creepy. There's something scary. Oh, I don't want to be in a house with her. But at the same time, <laughs> it's kind of turning that around and saying, oh, you know, she's, this is someone very empathetic. This is another person like him trapped in here. Um, and she really, she liked the, the, the fun of that. Yeah, to me, that's one of the more powerful moments of the film when she first sizes me up and she basically says like, no, this isn't gonna work. You need to get out of here. Like she can read 
the 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 victim in my heart she can see the pain that is so like available to be uh for the mazik and she's like you gotta go um and to me that's one of the most foreboding moments in the film uh because yakov the character he can do nothing but just stand there and look at the rebbe and say what am i supposed to trust this person or not i don't know and that's sort of what it comes down to for him is he doesn't really know what he can believe whether it's in his own psyche or in the world or in the people around him um there's there's another compliment here, so I'm just gonna pepper these in throughout. Uh, from Wes says, just a compliment. So many horror movies fall apart in the third act because the writers can't figure out how to get out of a mess they created. Thanks for finding a reasonable way out. So, um, there's yeah, it was fun playing with those sorts of tropes. You know, it's, it's, it's just those standard horror kind of things of, if you have a phone, why don't you just call the police? Or why don't you call someone to help you? And of course, we're, we play with that idea. And the, the, the most common haunted house sort of trope is, why don't you just leave the house? Like if you're in a haunted house, just leave. And so of course, you know, this was a way to do that. And again, just like the overall theme of he left and had to go back, it's the same with the house. You can leave, but you're gonna go back. Can we talk a little bit about that scene? Because um, <laughs> the physicality of that scene is just incredible. The sound effects, I mean, I was, you know, the, the breaking joints or whatever that is. How did you prepare for that? How did the, I'll start with you, Dave, and then Keith, I want to hear a little bit about the shooting and the, the sound that went over it. Well, Keith and I talked a lot about how that was going to go down. And Keith sort of brought to me the, um, the time frame of, look, when you leave the house, this is what's happening in your body. And by the time you get to here, it needs to be complete breakdown. And we spent a lot of time working out all the in-between and trying to iron it out. Um, but one of the things that really struck me last night when I was watching the film was those sound effects. And, and, and Keith had talked to me a lot about this is what it's going to sound like when, when this is happening in your body and this is happening in your body. And I really had fun with a lot of like the motions of my hand. Um, and, but a lot of that was just the trust that eventually it was going to make sense. And hearing it on, you know, through a, a television speaker I've seen it in theaters before, but really having that intimate experience with it, those sounds just make it so viscerally uncomfortable. Even for me who lived through it or for my brother sitting right next to me going, I know you're right next to me. I know you survived this because you're right there, but like you just want to close your eyes and cover your ears. And, and I really love that about the film. Yeah, that scene was definitely one of those uh, challenging ones and I you know writing it and kind of and certainly talking to Rafi when we were in pre-production like how are we going to actually make that work right how do you show this and you know and then working with Dave and, and Dave kind of coming up with these ideas of here's where I'm gonna this is going to give out and this is where this is going to give out and it, like I you know like Dave said it, it was one of the very last things we shot if not the last and uh we've been building up to it and the the uh and Brooklyn was appropriately uh absolutely freezing that night it was yeah. unbelievably cold and it was just one of those nights where it was just you know things were just you know crazy and it just we got to this point where dave just literally was throwing himself into this thing i mean he'd been prepping for it and it just he just let you know he was like I'm going to throw myself into that trash over there. And I was like, let's, let's, do it. let's go for it. I'm going to throw myself into yeah, that, that trash. That night of production is really underrated. We haven't talked about it enough, I don't think. No, we haven't. We haven't. So, I mean, look, the overall story of that night was I had shot listed and planned quite an elaborate sequence that elaborate in terms of the technical aspects involving a lot of Dolly work with the camera on tracks um it, just for each and every stage you, you see a lot of it we're going down the block we're going around the corner um and that night you know it, it was it was that was one of the few nights where the police were like uh no you're not <laughs> you're not making a ruckus at three in the morning this it night was, uh, we were like in the middle of shooting it and i was so like in my own head <laughs> and i see that there's some commotion happening and i go over what's going on and keith goes well um the police are shutting us down. And I went, <laughs> what? How much trouble are we in? And you went, we're in a little bit of trouble. And, you know, we, this was our last night of filming. So at this point we had sort of hit our stride and 
Rafi and Keith and I and our DP, Zach Cooperstein, who I, I don't think any of us can speak highly enough about. I mean, the film just looks incredible. We gathered together and we went, this is how much time we have. This is what we have to get. This is how it's getting done. And we mobilized and like the whole crew jumped to and everything just happened exactly as it needed to go down. It was really an incredible, like a, the sort of magical night of filming that can only happen in independent filmmaking. Yeah, I, I, think, I think our original schedule was we were shooting like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe halfway through the night, that's when the police showed up and they're like, we're shutting you down at two. And I went, I went, and then we had to pass out the do. rest of the day. And we, just to be clear, we had permits. Like, everything. Oh, right. Was, we it was not like an illegal shoot. It was just noise this, complaints. Yeah. It was just like, oh, okay. Like, you guys have to shut down for the night because you're being loud and people live here. <laughs> and I go, I go, I'm like all confident. Let me see what I can do. And I walk over to the cops. I'm like, hey, guys, how's it going? You know, like, drop character. So, is there anything we can do? And they're like, absolutely not. And I go back to the brain <laughs> trust and I'm like, I did my best. I don't know. We gotta keep moving. Yeah, it was it was one of those moments where, like I said, I had had a lot of shot listed ideas, probably four hours worth of setups that we had to put in forty five minutes, and it's at that point we would rip the camera off the dolly and go handheld, which I had been avoiding for this sequence in particular. And uh, you just you just leaned into it. You just kind of went with it. And it was one of those things where I'm running alongside with Zach uh, with a little portable monitor, just trying to see kind of what we're getting. I remember and, you so know. clearly standing <laughs> seeing Zach just like, I just like seeing Zach running around with the camera. It was just like so not planned. It was just chaos. He was just, you were just on the floor, Dave, and like Keith was there with the monitor and Zach was running around with the camera. And like all of a sudden, like our pretty like well-produced, production everything was going pretty well it just turned into chaos the last night of shooting and it worked sometimes you're on production and you just like you just it feels like the lowest point you're just like i don't know how this is going to work and then you know sometimes you just get to the yeah, end it just works and that's how you know because i was like in the <laughs> the They've had a little, a, a great line in there. Oh, I can't even remember what it was, Dave, when you're asking I what, I, what you should do. You were asking what you should do. Cause I was like, I was, we were trying to figure out, you know, how each, everyone should work. And I was like, Zach, you do this. And uh, sound, you do this. And then Dave's like, oh, yeah. what, what, what do I do? <laughs> what do, what do I do? Um, you go, yeah, no, I remember it now. You go, uh, all right, pick up those dolly tracks, grab those lights pick up the camera. We're getting this shot. We're getting this shot. We're getting that shot. Dave, you, all right. Yeah, Dave. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> but it was one of those things where you're shooting it in that moment. And I could, I could sense that, yeah, it's a super chaotic moment. This is like the most visceral sort of thing happening to him. It would make sense that it feels like that, but you can't know in the moment when you're making it. It's only afterwards. I went up to Rafi at the monitor who'd been watching across the street at the big monitor. And I was like, I don't even know. Like, what did we get? Did we get it? Like, what did we get? And he was like, and Rafi said, you know, to Rafi's credit, he was like, I think you're going to be surprised at how great that came out because I know you didn't plan it like that, but I think you'll be surprised. And, and, and I was, I was surprised at how it just punctuated that moment in a way that we hadn't anticipated. It's also like such a fun thing about independent film. Like, you know, the stories like, Oh, because the, the shark broke in Jaws and then they showed less of the shark and you pr they probably thought that was the worst thing ever at the time. And obviously the scariest stuff in Jaws is the POV stuff in the shark. And that, and once you start seeing the shark, it started to become, become silly. And then Robert Rodriguez always talks about his first movie, was El Mariachi, where people would always compliment him on the lighting. And he was like, I didn't have any lighting. We made this movie for $6,000. So it's just like these things that, that you think are going to be problems sometimes end up being cool. The kismet. Yeah, it worked That's out so well. Market. That's what's fun about making indie movies for those reasons. It definitely worked because it we were it was the first time in a while we'd been out of the house and the and the difference in style I think just worked really beautifully um, to take us out of that space. Um, I want to get to another question here before you guys need to get off um, from Samara Metzler. During the final moments with the Mazik, I'm fairly certain I heard Yaakov say, "Mr. Litvak, let him go." How intentional was the idea that Mr. Litvak attracted the Mazak with his guilt rather than the Mazak appeared first to torment him, worsening the guilt? And what's the relationship sort of in the embodiment of the Mazak? Yeah, we, we, we talked about that a lot, you know, and it was the sort of, 
uh, you know, part of that was trying to understand what was going to be English, what was going to be Yiddish, what were the lines said. And it was a sort of a natural uh, result to interchange the idea of let him go and let it go. Mm. I think it was important that, I mean, this whole sequence towards the end here is this kind of a hallucinatory sequence in that it's essentially the right, the body's writhing on the stretcher. We think we've defeated the mazik, and then here's this thing happening. And it was kind of like, well, if we're going to do an exorcism ish sort of scene, what would that look like? And it's releasing it. Yaakov at that point has uh, kind of overcome his guilt to a certain extent, and now he's going to help the spirit of Mr. Litvak. And you could read into it this concept in Judaism of the spirit hovering above the body, that, that the spirit's still there, and so he's actively fully into it, or not, or it could be just still something in Yaakov's head. Um, but it was clear that those two events, those two traumas, while vastly different in scale, kind of had the same resonance in terms of destroying lives. Um, and so, yeah, when we did that moment, yeah, Dave was, it was a lot of focus um, and it's a very powerful sort of moment. And it just, right, that interchangeability just became clear. It's just who's letting what go, who's, you know, and who is he? Because it's, it's both of them. And it's very much Yaakov talking to himself Mm -hmm. as well as to this corpse, as well as to a spirit, as well as to the, you know, there's just so much, it just kind of boiled down to this sort of very uh, just core idea that's kind of embodied in that. And Dave did a beautiful job with that moment. It's very, it's very strong. Yeah, that's, 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 that, I also just love, I thought about this now, but I love that we come to this movie where there's a dead body lying there. And then like that body character has an arc yeah <laughs> which is really yeah good. that's very cool. great yeah yeah it's really amazing too because you you feel like that's gonna be the scary thing and it turns out you care for that body as much as a shoimer is supposed to care for that body yeah, it's also at that point like once Jakob does his thing the movie is not really scary anymore which is also what i kind of love like it doesn't have the pressure to try to be scary anymore it just goes full you know, like euphoric emotion, color, music, violin, you know, I, I kind of like that transition. It's not something, it's a pretty unusual thing. The movie kind of has, has two endings. But I, has, I, everybody I seen, has everybody seen the film on here? Is the yes. spoiler? So, I don't think this, I think everyone. too late for that, that yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. My, my little brother, I thought it was so amazing. He was like, he was like, this is such a scary movie. It touches on so much stuff and he goes, I cannot tell you how happy I was that it's like this strong, satisfying, like redemptive ending and not like the sad, you know, dark ending that it could have easily been, you know, that it, I mean, wouldn't make so much sense in the context. And, and I agree, you know, watching it last night for the first time in a while, I was like, it's kind of a feel good movie. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. I, no, go ahead, Valky. No, that's how I talk all my friends who say, oh, I don't like horror films. That's how I talk them into watch this one. I'm like, A, nobody dies in the film. <laughs> B, it has a pretty good ending. And then they're like, okay, okay. <laughs> and then they yeah, kill. Yeah. It was so scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, that kind of catharsis was super important. And, and it's, it's weird, but it makes a lot of sense Jewishly for me as well. In a Christian film, let's say that involves the devil and demons they're there for your soul right and like drag you to hell and you can have those very bleak dark endings where at the you know in, in a different ending Yaakov would have been dragged kicking and screaming into the darkness and that would then the credits roll and it's like punch you in the face mm -hmm. but that didn't feel very Jewish to me especially since if we think about the mazik in the larger terms right the mazik you know God's omnipotent so the mazik is a part of that the, the point of the mazik isn't to like condemn Yaakov's soul. The point is for Yaakov to face his fear and overcome something. And he did it. He did it. And so you'd want that cathartic, redemptive sort of piece at the end because this was the journey. Um, so th that seemed to make sense to me. Yeah, that was always intentional from the beginning. We always talk, there's two kinds of horror movies out there and I love them both equally. There's at least the way I call them, I call them mean horror movies and nice horror movies. And they're both great, but from the beginning, you know, we always knew this was going to be a nice one. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I, there's a line in the film where, you, where I think it's Mrs. Litvak says to Yaakov, they're not, they're not nightmares, they're memories. And I think mm. sort of that, that sort of encompasses this whole idea that we're not dealing just with demons, we're dealing with trauma and we're dealing with um, something that he can work his way out of. Yeah, I, I once heard that uh, Kubrick, when asked about why he made The Shining, he said, I made it to hurt people. And this film, I really feel like, exists to heal people. To terrify them, for sure. <laughs> but it's a very healing film, in my opinion. Yeah, we're getting a lot of comments about how scared people were here. So uh, Yeah, so also, that... just to be clear, first and foremost, it is a horror movie. We should have to make the <laughs> scariest movie we could possibly make. You can pitch it to your friends anyway to get them to watch it, but ultimately they will be scared. So um, <laughs> we have we have another question from the audience and I know you have to run shortly. So, um, but there's a question from Mary. I was really touched by Malky and Dave's character interaction after the first meeting, uh, Yaakov not knowing how to deal with even going for coffee. Can you speak to the, I mean, Malky, you can speak a little bit to the creation of your character and, and how you play into, um, these awkward interactions in the beginning and sort of the role of Malky's character in the film in general. Of course, I mean, this girl is very close to my heart, you know. <laughs> I've been in her shoes many times, still am. Um, what I love about this is the, the you know, the loss when, when these people leave, when, when we leave the community, there is this moment of, you feel like it's impossible. And for the beginner, the new kid, to see someone that knows technology, someone that is a little bit ahead, is refreshing and, and uplifting. And for the person that already knows how to use the, the phone but doesn't know how to solve other problems, is this feeling of like, oh, wow, I, I am the helper. I have accomplished. And I think with Sarah, she has this really moment of like, she sees potential and she's like, let me teach him everything that I know. And, and it kind of makes her feel, her feel good. That she's already in that place where she can help. Uh, probably this is one of the few places where she feels like, you know, <laughs> the one that knows. And um, also, I think there's something really cute about him. If you see the table, if she was going to talk to someone, I think she wants to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, I I think that that scene of the footsteps moment was so real for all of us. Most of the cast were actual people who left the community, and Dave was so present and so honest with the character that I don't think any of us remember that this is a film. It felt just like a moment where we're all saying this is hard, and how are we gonna do this? So yeah, it was. Sorry, for me, for me, it was a privilege to be able to uh, be surrounded by people who were so close to living the life that the film was trying to represent. You know, it's almost like getting to be a fly on the wall in some ways. And that was just an honor as an actor to be able to jump into that world and to join uh, in on that journey of so many wonderful actors in that scene particularly. And Malky, of course, because I mean, everything with Malky was a joy. Thank you. Well, I know we need to wrap up and I, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, the film is going to be available widely. I can let you do the, um, share the information. Is it the 26th that will be available on VOD? Purim. Uh, Purim. Yes, this Purim, this Friday, Eric Chavez, the <laughs> film will be widely available on all video on demand platforms, iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Vudu, the whole VOD on your, through your cable box, the whole thing and in some select theaters where open and safe throughout the country. Great. Well, tell your friends, you can pitch it like Malky did or as a horror film, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, <laughs> tell all of your Jewish, because this is a Jewish film, but tell all of your Jewish friends who wouldn't normally see a horror movie to see this one. Because that crossover is what's so exciting to me. Yeah, tell them it's a comedy. Tell <laughs> them to watch it. Tell them we said they should watch it. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Keith. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Malky. Thank you again to Tamar Simon from Mean Streets Management and to IFC Films. And thank you also to the Coolidge Corner Theater for partnering on tonight's program. Um, I look forward 
to hearing what people think as the film goes out to a wider audience. I'm sure there will be more great reactions. And thank you to everyone who joined us here tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next week at the Boston Israeli Film Festival. Uh, have a good thank night. Thank you everyone. so much, Ariana. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all, Thanks, thank you all for yeah. watching the movie.